Can she you hear me tuning the dummy arms? If you reach and grab them, we'll definitely hear it. <laughs> Don't tell Remy I was eating your gummy worms. Okay, I won't. <laughs> I was going to say, for everybody listening on podcast form, we're currently in Chris's van in the parking lot of Transition recording this. You could call it a sound studio now if you want. There is a lot of 3M soundproofing material on the walls here because that's why I used to insulate it. We did that in my van. It's good for ground road noise. It's good for the road noise. Yeah. All right. I'll read a little intro and we'll get into this. Cool. What's going on, everybody? This is Jason Schroeder with Vital MTV, and today I'm joined by Chris Mandel from SRAM to discuss their brand new powertrain e-bike system. It's a long time coming, but SRAM has finally entered the e-bike space. The meat and potatoes of the system is that it features a bros motor custom tuned by SRAM. It's paired with either a 600 or 730 watt hour battery, and it's heavily integrated and only compatible with SRAM's latest T-type transmission. Chris, thank you for having us come out to Bellingham, giving us the chance to uh, check out all this stuff. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming, and um, thanks for putting the time in on the on the bike and with the questions. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So, SRAM, I would say, is probably a little bit behind the curve when it comes to launching an e-bike system, but I know that has allowed you guys to observe the landscape and identify ways to improve on maybe what already exists out in the world. Take us through the philosophy and goals behind Powertrain, and what was that development process like? Yeah, you know, I think I think for us, we want to make sure when we're going to move into a space, we're bringing something to the rider that they they can't get currently in the market, and and provides them with a huge benefit. Um, and so, from our perspective, as we've been watching everything develop, um, you know, we wanted to bring out a system that allowed the bike to function as a whole unit and get the rider further and get the rider more connected to the trail. And it's like, okay, well, that's a whole lot of words. What do you really actually mean by that? And, you know, for us, there's, there's adding to the amount of watts that a rider can put out. And that's what your motor and your battery work together to do. But, you know, the drivetrain transmission is integral to that so for us having transmission knowing that that can shift under load and be a very robust system mm -hmm. um i don't know how it is for you but i've hit more derailers on e-bikes than anything else so like having a robust derailleur back there is really important especially when you have something that's pulling uphill with a lot of power and has a lot of weight behind it mm -hmm. so so adding that in um was really key for us and then having the access protocol that allows everything to connect together seamlessly is another huge part of it to eliminate cables eliminate things that you see on your uh, on your handlebars but then also allow the rider to interface with the bike a lot cleaner you know like just you get on you turn this thing on you get on it and you ride it and you don't have to do anything other than that you know you don't have to worry about which setting you're in that we have two modes for this system it's range and rally can you guess which one does which? <laughs> you know, we're trying to keep it really straightforward because at the end of the day, we're all just having fun out in the woods on our bikes. And we use technology and innovation to get riders closer to that. And and we don't want to put any barriers in between the rider and, and the trail and the experience they're trying to have out there. And that sounds like a lot, but at the same time, it does mean you have to make some hard decisions about like what you're not going to do versus what you are going to do. Um, so for us, you know, being able to bring transmission, bring a motor, bring battery technology that we believe in all together um, with controls that are at the rider's fingertips really is what, what had us make the leap to, to bring a powertrain system in. I know simplicity and integration are two words that have been brought up a lot when we've been talking about powertrain. Can you maybe touch on from a... OEM spec or a brand incorporating powertrain, kind of what that looks like, and then what does that look like from a consumer point of view? Yeah, so I mean, you'll see we have specific OEM partners with that that we're launching powertrain with. So Nuke Proof, Gas Gas, Transition, and Propane, and those partners are are 
people and product teams that we've worked with throughout the course of the development. They've been part of our black box testing program. They've also written, written different iterations of it over time. So from their perspective, you know, they were giving us feedback on things like motor mounts. They were also testing early versions of the motor to see how they felt about the power delivery that we were option offering. They tested early sh versions of co-shift. They also tested early versions of, um, auto shifting. Mm -hmm. So they would have seen that full development suite and they would have been working on frames and the frame geometries around all of that, as well as, you know, the brass tacks of like how the battery is going to mount, which size mm -hmm. batteries are you going to offer? Um, what kind of batteries are you going to offer between like an exchangeable battery, uh, a battery that you can swap out of the frame or a battery that's, that's installed in the frame. Um, so from their perspective, that's a, that's kind of the space that they're working in. And they, you know, as they were working on that, they also had to understand and have confidence in transmission. So simultaneously, they would have also been testing transmission mm -hmm. um, and things like the pod controller and, um, you know, the access app is also um, what controls this system. It's the same access app that you have today that would control any of our other com connected components. And then from the rider's perspective, you know, it really spans the full um, experience that a rider is going to have from getting on the bike to having things serviced. And then should the rider have an issue with something, having it warrantied or, um, working on a replacement part in case of like a, a, you know, damage that was to occur, um, that wasn't a warranty. So that full suite in terms of the rider's experience, um, just like you would have with one of our derailers or a fork, um, is going to be what you're going to experience there. I also think, um, you know, going back to the like simplicity and the integration side of things, it's a pretty meaningful thing for a rider to be able to have, you know, this, it's the same pod controller that you would have on your GX bike today mm -hmm. is what's controlling your powertrain bike tomorrow. So you, know, you, you literally could take that off of one bike, put it onto this bike and integrate it through. It's the same reverb access that interfaces with the whole system. And that has a meaningful impact in terms of being able to switch from one bike to the other, if you have more than one bike, but it also means that like the bike mechanic who's working on your bike knows exactly how everything works and they've worked on it before and they've seen it before. So nice. What are the, we're just talking about powertrain as a system what are kind of your main components that make up everything because there are a few less than maybe other systems all in the market right now yeah totally so obviously there's a battery um we offer two different sizes of battery a 630 and a 720 mm -hmm. um and then um we have the motor which we partnered with bros on mm -hmm. and have worked really closely with them and again like the software that's running behind that motor is stuff that we worked really closely with Broza on and we've tested back and forth with our um, black box race team on that product. Um, and then we do have a, like a display that lives in the top tube. Um, that display just communicate or, you know, communicates relevant information to the rider, things like battery life is on there as a percentage. Um, it also tells you if you're in range or rally and if your, um, auto shift is on or off and what settings it's inside of that. And then, um, we do have a wheel speed sensor, which is really important for knowing a bunch of different pieces of information. But as far as the rider is concerned, what that's going to do is we have six magnets in that wheel speed sensor, and that gives us a really high fidelity on what speed the bike is going. And that's what allows us to have coast shift, which is when the bike can shift um, while you're not pedaling, but you are moving. So you can shift in the middle of a rock garden where you wouldn't be able to pedal so you can get back into the right gear. Or, and this is a situation you run into a lot on e-bikes where you're going down something steep and you know you're about to go up a steep climb. You can shift pretty easily and pretty quickly without pedaling into an easier gear. And then the other thing that's a really, you know, greatly simplifies the rider's experience on the bike is we have auto shift. So auto shift, um, uses that wheel speed information, uses the ability of transmission to shift under load. 
um, and lays it on top of our algorithms and the rest of what's happening inside the motor to allow the rider to give considerably less shifting inputs to the bike and allow it to shift on its own and keep you in a, the cadence that you've pre-selected um, and it'll shift to keep you in that given cadence range. So it's, it's pretty cool in that it like really cuts down on how much input you have to give the bike to be able to go through the course of a ride. You know, it's not a predictive system, so it doesn't see that like mega steep climb that's right in front of you. So sometimes you do need to like give it a little bit of information and, and apply a shift here or there um, just because it doesn't know that steep climb is coming. But it's, it really cuts down on like the total number of shifts that you have to do if you if you want to run that system. And again, if you don't feel comfortable with auto shift and you want to be in control of what you're doing, like it's a one quick button push and you don't have that uh, turned on anymore. Yep. Let's touch more on the Brosa motor and you guys custom tuning the software behind that. What characteristics might a rider expect to feel with that motor? What was like the goal behind how you guys wanted it to feel when you're pedaling? Yeah, so I mean, this is really where a lot of the feedback from OEMs comes in and what they were looking for and what they were feeling. But the the place where we really got the like quickest and the feedback and the feedback that we could iterate on was from Yannick, our black box um, test rider, who was the 2022 e EWS champion, mm -hmm. overall champion. And what was really great about having him on that program and so closely tied out with our engineering teams was that he would obviously be testing a lot, riding the bike a lot, and training. And and he actually rode all the bikes um, and was able to you know switch in between them as he needed to or as he wanted to. But he was really able to like be an expert on what changing little things here and there were going to give the end rider in terms of like overall power feel, the 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 mapping of the power how all of that was going to result in traction or a lack of traction and and how that was going to show up on making a climb or not making a climb and so that feedback loop is really what came into it um so so for us at the end of the day we, we want a rider to be able to get on the bike and as much as possible just ride and make it up the climbs that they want to make it up and so for us it was making that as like intuitive and seamless as possible so making the bike respond to the rider's needs and and that's really like the direction that we headed and the way we got there was through feedback from the OEMs but really also through feedback from Yannick on what he was needing on the race side of things and what we found is we've like given the bikes out to a broader group of riders is like that feedback from the race side of things and the black box testing really just allows anyone to go out and ride the bike and have a good time and I think like you know you saw as you've ridden the bike, you've seen what that experience has been like for you. And yep. um, it's a pretty intuitive feel. Yeah. I know I almost hate saying that because it, it kind of sounds played out a little bit. But that was my experience in the last two days is the way I had to... I didn't have to change my riding style to be given the assist that I wanted in given situations. As opposed to maybe other motor systems... Uh, are best optimized riding a certain way or pedaling a certain way to receive that power in the most efficient way possible. And I think it was in our group that we rode with the past two days, we all talked a lot about traction. I think traction was a pretty key takeaway of how the power feeds in in a very natural assistance and feeling way that you don't end up having many moments where it feels like the assistant surges or gives you too much at the wrong time. It's kind of always right there, almost in the background when you want it with how you're pedaling, which is a very cool, cool experience. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a hard fought experience. You know, like it takes a lot of like really intimate conversations between the test rider and an engineer who has to like translate that feeling into like how an algorithm is going to respond underneath you. Sounds like Yannick's a pretty great asset. Yeah, his feedback is like 
excellent in terms of like translating what a writer is experiencing and wants to experience and like getting that through to you know someone who mostly writes code <laughs> <laughs> taking on trail experience and turning it into numbers yeah yeah <laughs> i love it well speaking of just the motor and the power that it can provide you guys chose to go with two modes you mentioned earlier range and rally what was the whole thought process behind that yeah so before we get into the thought process behind that because we kind of mentioned it a little bit but you know those are adjustable inside the app so you can go inside the app and you can adjust how much power range is delivering and you can adjust how much power um, rally is delivering mm -hmm. but the thing that really pushed us to go into that space is you know talking to e-bike riders today talking to people who are e-bike curious um a lot of it was the what mode should i be in for what given circumstance i have battery anxiety i don't have battery anxiety i just want as much power as possible a lot of questions and a lot of confusion um and a lot of like stabbing at very complicated remotes trying to figure out what to be and where to go and the thing that really sort of like percolated up and that that kept staring us in the face there is people want to have clean simple but effective experience on their bikes and on the e-bike you're focused on range going really far distances distances or you're focusing on rallying up the trail and having a really good time. And, and I mean, those two words just like evoke exactly what we're going for there. Mm -hmm. And so that, that binary and having those two options really was pretty clear to us in terms of differentiating, but also like at getting at what riders needs were on a trail. Um, and like, you can't imagine like not shifting gears in certain instances, you know, you're in, range you're in the right gear that you need to be in there's a short little techie climb right in front of you and it's only a couple meters long and you just one push of a button you're in rally you rally up that and then you go back to range yeah it is very nice being able to just with one button jump between two modes that have fairly distinct characteristics as it comes out of the box but also really usable. I think that's a huge one. Like I'll make the comparison to Shimano EP8 because it's what a lot of people do now. And when you have, I would say most people don't use Eco, the lowest mode that Shimano offers too much. Unless you go into the app and you adjust everything up, it kind of becomes useless unless you're trying to limp an almost dead battery back home sort of vibe. And having two modes that are both very usable made the on-trail experience simpler in a lot of ways because there's less to think about and you also know that you can kind of separate in your mind when each one has it is is best used but yeah it was cool for me i was a little hesitant coming into it it doesn't mean that uh i think i think lars made a good point we were talking about the repeater is that if you want a system that has all like seven assist modes like those do exist out there then this is going for a a specific type of rider experience like we're talking about so yeah totally and i mean i think i think rider experience for us is really important mm -hmm. like the number of times i have hit that upper left button and switched from range to rally or vice versa and i never have to look down at the screen to know if i'm in one or the other because i know that i hit the button mm -hmm. and i'm just there and that's that's the situation it sounds like a little thing, but if you repeat that a hundred times over the course of a ride or, you know, the thousands of times over the course of ownership of the bike, that's the kind of premium experience that we're trying to deliver across the like wide range of, of options in terms of these bikes. Again, like every little piece of the puzzle comes back and reinforces that like the pods are the same pods that you're going to experience on any transmission equipped bike. Mm -hmm. Um, the shifting is going to be the same as what you're going to experience on any transmission bike. Mm -hmm. The clean cockpit is also going to be something that you're going to experience. Um, 
that you can't get from other systems. Yeah. Going into transmission a bit more, we've already kind of touched on how it's very integral in the powertrain and its ability to shift under load. But that does mean that to ride a powertrain equipped bike, you do have to use transmission. There's no option to do a mechanical drivetrain and stuff like that. So the, the bikes will, all the bikes that are coming with it initially will have transmission on it. You can build a bike with a, with the motor and the battery with mechanical okay. shifting, um, but you lose co-shift and you lose um, auto shift when you do that, obviously. Um, and then you also won't have the advantage of being able to like shift as robustly under load or, um, cause I don't know about you, but I crash every once in a while, <laughs> uh, crash and, and like have a robust drive system through that. So got you. I didn't see you crash over the last two days out. Okay. I think I crashed. <laughs> you definitely fell over maybe the most. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> An impressive amount, actually. Um, so the bikes that are going to come with transmission at launch, the derailleur is powered off of the battery. Is that correct? Um, I, I can't remember in every instance, but I believe so. I believe every bike does come with our hot shoe. So it would be hot shoot from the battery to the derailleur. Um, and, and that just allows you to, you know, just have one less access battery that you have to, um, keep track of. You can put a standard battery in there if you, if you want. And the Seacoast does use a standard access battery for the mechanics out there. Just so you guys know, when you put the bike in the stand to work on it, you can turn the bike on. And then if you quickly touch the power button again, it'll put the bike into service mode so that you can uh, actuate the derailleur without having the motor kick in so you don't have the wheel spinning really fast when you're doing that. Um, and then another thing uh, is the once the battery is, if, if you do drain the battery down to zero to the point where like it's no longer to provide, able to provide you with assist, um, you will have about two hours um, approximately of shifting on the derailleur before that goes out too. Sweet. Yeah. What about for people who don't want to run an axis reverb? What are the options right now for that? Yeah. So, um, there are, you, you do need to run the left shifter pod with, if you want to be able to have, um, you know, adjust range rally on the fly. Um, so whenever, uh, driver post lever you're using just needs to be able to fit with that left pod so that's kind of the, the constraint on that side would you be able to remove the pod and still use the bike as an e-bike if you just wanted to have only a dropper lever you can do that then you would to switch between range and rally you would have to like reach down to the display to okay. switch between range and rally gotcha. yeah so yes like functionally it's there it doesn't have the like Mm -hmm. it's not as integrated and, and functional as it would otherwise be, but yes. Okay. We touched a lot on auto shift and co shift. So I think people understand that pretty well at this point. How do you see riders applying each of those features on the trail? Yeah. Well, so I mean, co shift is at least for me as someone who's like been riding e-bikes for a while now, it was one of the things that was kind of like first on my list to want to have because very often you have the instance of like coming down a trail and then immediately trying to go back up a steep hill um and and not wanting to throw pedals in on the way down so coast shift is is really great for use cases like that it's also um really nice in rock gardens when you know you're not in quite the gear you want to be in but you don't want to throw a pedal at that moment that's kind of the use case there on um on coast shift and then you know auto shift it it's really a uh, rider preference. Like I find myself turning it on and off throughout the course of a ride. Cause there will be situations where I'm like, this is great. Like I don't have to think about what I'm doing. The bike is operating. I'm paying attention to the trail and what I feel like, you know, like the cadence is, is getting me into the right gear at the right time. And then there's other times where I'm like, I want to be in exactly control of where I, where I am in the cassette. And so I'm going to like, put it into manual mode and, and shift as I want. Um, so I think it really comes down to like rider preference in that space. 
And I also think, you know, the type of terrain that a rider is going to ride is going to dictate a lot of that too, you know, in terms of like climbing up a fire road versus climbing up a technical climb. Um, all those kind of different factors are going to come, come into it, but it's nice because it's one click of a button and you can change that around. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I think you mentioned that already, but auto shift, you basically can hold your right bottom button. Is that correct? Uh, upper right. Upper right button. You basically can hold that and it toggles it between being on and off. Yep. So if you're listening to this and you are very anti auto shift for whatever reason, you never have to use it if you don't prefer to. Yeah. Lower right is how you adjust auto shift and the cadence preference. Do you mind just explaining what changing those parameters actually does and how you see how riders will end up using that? Yeah. So we, so the, the input that auto shift uses to make a decision about what gear you're in is it's trying to leave you in the cadence that you have sort of pre-selected in that space. So it comes in a mid setting. I, don't, I can't remember the exact like RPMs that those cadence settings for, but it's got seven total adjustments. So you can go, you know, from the mid setting up three or down three from there. And basically what that's doing is setting your cadence window that you're trying to stay in, that the, that the, the derailleur will shift to try to always keep you in that cadence setting based on your rear wheel speed. Um, so it's going to, um, respond to how fast your legs are spinning given the speed that the bike is going. Um, and then each one of those windows, um, which you can, again, pushing the lower right hand button, you can move yourself in between those seven different settings to, to achieve that, that cadence. Which is very easy to do as you're moving, as I experienced the last two days, because it takes a moment of just feeling what it mid is and how it comes and then making a choice if you need to make a change either way but it's easy to do on the fly it's shown on the display what you're changing via the pod is doing let's just give all the details on the pods because you only have four buttons do you just want to run through what each button does out of the box yeah so and again this is out of the box but mm -hmm. inside the app you can change a lot of this configuration around so starting at the upper left button, that is your mode adjust. So that's going to move you from range to rally. If you tap it short, if you push and hold on it, that's your walk mode. Lower left is your seat post. Upper right is shifting into a harder gear. Or if you push and hold, that's what turns on auto shift or turns off auto shift. Lower right is your downshift. Uh, you're shipped into an easier gear rather. Um, and that if you push and hold allows you to adjust your auto shift cadence settings. Again, you can adjust all that in the app. There are a little, a few constraints on what you can adjust. So for example, if you were to try to move your dropper seat post to the upper left button, that would disable your walk mode because there's kind of a safety concern there. We don't want your, we don't want you accidentally putting your seat up when you're intending to, to walk mode. So there's some things like that where you can't cross do things. But like, for example, if you wanted to shift into an easier gear on your bottom left button and shift and shift into an easier or a harder gear on your um, bottom right button, a la ETAP style shifting, you can do that configuration and it's not a problem. Sweet. I'm getting to the end of my questions here. I think one of the biggest one was the, uh, is battery life displayed in per sense, but you already said yes to that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I think a lot of people will appreciate that. Is there anything we didn't cover? No, I think that was, that was pretty exhaustive. You know, I think, you know, the, the team that worked on this project was really passionate and like really focused on connecting this product with the actual ride experience that people are having out on the trail. And, you know, I think you experienced that over the last few days. I know I've experienced that as a rider who, you know, to me, EMTBs fulfill a certain niche, just like gravel bikes or cross country bikes or enduro bikes do. And I, I like to do what I want to do on my e-bike, which is like climb technical trails. For me, that's like the novel novelty of the experience of riding an e-bike. So for me, getting and riding this product has been pretty great because it does that really, really well. 
but it also works great if you're going to climb up a fire road and then descend down a trail. I mean, that it also works great in that space too. So sweet. I dig it. Uh, when should riders expect to start to see power train out in the wild? This will this podcast will come out on the 28th when power train is released to the world, but will bikes be available at that time roughly? Yeah. So, um, in the days following this podcast, you will see the launches of our other partners who have bikes around this and they will communicate their individual, uh, product availability around that. Sweet. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me in your lovely van. No problem. I'm glad you enjoyed the van. Didn't be too stuffy in here. Nah, it worked out perfect. I mean, your sound studio. Yeah, your mobile sound, sound studio. studio. Yeah. Where you can open and close the bridge. So that works. Yeah. <laughs> give, give people some ASMR for to end it out. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. Thank you. Thank you.